like to welcome everybody today to the first uh, Northeast Region Aerostar Owners Association Maintenance and Safety Seminar. We're in Danbury, Connecticut, and uh, we got rained out yesterday, and we're happy to have about a dozen Aerostar pilots with us today. Um, we're at the uh, hangar of Master Aviation in uh, Danbury. Mr. Allen Speakmaster is with us. He's been kind enough uh, to, quote, volunteer his services. Uh, it took a little arm twisting because he's a little shy, but he, he knows so much about this airplane, he's got nothing to be shy about. And um, also with us is uh, Mr. Robbie Zahn, who's a, a multi-thousand hour Aerostar pilot, the president of Business Aircraft Center. And uh, from my own experience of having flown with Robbie, he, he knows more than I'll ever know about the airplane. And uh, we'll be able to give us some tips in terms of flying. And uh, also we're honored to have Steve Oster, who's the president of the Aerostar Owners Association. Um, Steve has uh, been with the association 10 years and, and not only knows a lot, but can give a lot of interesting vignettes as well, <laughs> some of the things that have gone on through the years. Uh, hmm. Okay, let's change it. Yes. First of all, good morning everybody. Thank you for coming. We were debating on what format to go through with the day and basically after several hours of discussion came up with a grand total of zero. So I said to Ken, why don't we just basically start at the front of the aeroplane and work backwards. So that's how we started. So what we're going to do is we're basically going to start off with a prop. And I would say up front, if you, if you have any questions anywhere along, just shout the questions out and give me a good excuse to stop talking for a while. The prop, as you know, is a parcel three-bladed fully feathering prop, of which this is the completed model. The prop with the blades, the counterweights, prop boot restrainers, and the hub of the prop, which is air-filled, oil-filled, and on the later models has a spring. A few interesting points about the prop that you probably have never stopped to think about before, and it's very awakening we do, and that's the fact that when one of these props is running at 2700 RPM, the 16 tons pulling out was on each blade. That's an awful lot of pressure that you don't stop and think about. And as the average pilot, as part of your pre-flight, you'll walk out to the propeller, run your fingers down it, and if you don't draw blood, as far as you're concerned, the prop's in good, good condition. Unfortunately, that's not the point, because the point is when the prop is running, the forces on the blades are bending the forces forward. Now what happens is, you can have nicks on the front of the blade, on the edge. If you have damage to the face of the blade, which is the flat side, and you have the blade bending forward with that strain on it, 90% of the prop blade separations are from damage on this side. Yes, you should be going along checking the front for damage. You should also be looking at the back side. Any damage on this back side is ultra important. As I say, especially when you think you've got 16 tons pulling outwards on this blade and you've got the blade bending forward trying to pull the airplane along, damage on this back, you, are, you really run a very strong risk of having a break blade break. As far as the prop itself, I thought it would be a good idea. Everybody's heard about springs and we all know about checking, checking the domes for air pressure inside it and locks and counterweights. What actually is it? What does it all do? Hartzell very kindly lent us this section of the prop, which of course normally, when you're looking at it, you just see this side. <coughs> you just see the piston dome, the hub, the blades, and the counterweights. Inside it, this is the famous spring that Hartzell put in their propellers. They had problems several years ago where if a propeller lost its charge, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily feather because the counterweights lose their feathering momentum once they get to about 45 degrees and without the air pressure, the prop will not feather. So if the air pressure on the original system with no springs was, say, 100 psi, they couldn't come up with a spring that would make up for the 100 psi. So they said, let's split the difference. We'll have a spring that's 50 psi and we'll still use 50 psi there. So what they did was basically halve the air pressure and stuck the big spring in there as well. When your engine is stationary and nothing is turning, the center section of this prop in here has inside it blocks. And what happens is the center rod 
here which moves up and down when the prop is moving on the end of it has a large washer which once it's slipped through the locks stays above the locks and will not go through as soon as your engine is over about 800 rpm centrifugal force throws the locks outwards now the centre rod is free to move up and down at that point your governor is now working with the engine and the governor in essence being a high pressure pump pushes oil up through the centre of the tube in the bottom comes out in a drilled hole on the back side of this rod where you can't see it into this area here which is below the piston this area here, this item here being the piston when the prop is charged with air all of this front area is filled with air what will now happen is that you are now at takeoff RPM and the governor is sensing that the propeller and the engine speed is now at the right speed so it will stop pushing oil into this area if for any reason it senses that your propeller and your engine speed is too slow it needs to speed the RPM up and to speed the RPM up it has to turn the blades finer to turn the blades finer the governor sends more oil back through this tube so this area in here gets, receives more oil pressure when it does so it pushes this whole piston assembly which is this which slides up and down it pushes this piston out towards the dome the piston which is attached to the rod moves the rod the rod moves this this fork and the fork which is attached to the blade each side moves up and twists the blade finer <coughs> conversely when the governor senses that the engine speed is now too high and it wants to slow it down a bit so it basically just bleeds off some of this pressure that's in here and the spring and the air move this piston back down that basically is how the propeller works um, a few salient points on there might be that if it's a real, real freezing cold day when you land and you shut the prop down don't be surprised if you climb out your airplane and you look at your prop and you find your prop sitting there in feather you haven't done anything, all you've done is just done, done your normal shutdown but you look at the prop and the prop's in feather and what's happened is that inside here the counterweight uh, of the, uh, the locking mechanism because of the cold and because of the lubrication in there they haven't snapped back in as quick as they should have done so as they're thinking about closing in the rod has already passed through it so now what happens is the spring in the air will just push the prop down into feather and it means absolutely nothing ideally to save any load on the engine you'd have to release the air pressure out of the dome use blade paddles on both blades turn the blades back into fine pitch and when they go back through the, the latching mechanism you'll hear a click alternatively you can just start the engine <coughs> the problem in doing that is it puts a real strong load on the engine and when the weather changes your air pressure in your tires contract, you have less pressure in your tire the pressure in your dome shrinks up and I was having some fluctuations in my propeller, RPM would just flutter, flutter, flutter and it turned out that the pressure is supposed to be 40 or 45 or 50 and mine had gone down to 20 something and all it takes is a shot of nitrogen and your problem is cured yeah, the, but the pressure is very sensitive to temperature and on the prop phones and in the service manual and in, even in the spinner they give you a chart of pressures and temperatures at this temperature the pressure should be this amount ok the part that actually works the prop is called a governor before I move on let me just mention two other things on the props the props have on the leading edges the heated the ice boot of the ice boot of which this is then around the boots they have these brass coloured items which are propeller de ice boot restrainers and they basically support this wire so that this wire doesn't break if you send your propellers away for overhaul it's standard practice now even from Hartzell that they do not reuse these restrainers there is no service bulletin or service letter or AD that relieves the service manual or the parts catalogue requirement that says you do use them so if you send your propellers to Hartzell for overhaul or for the AD compliance your props will come back minus these restrainers the parts catalogue and the service manual tells you all about the installation of these restrainers your aeroplane is maintained to the service manual and to the airframe manufacturer's parts catalogue 
so irrespective of the fact that the overhaul facility will not give you these restrainers back and will say to you quote we don't use these anymore we use these tie wraps legally you've still got to put these on because it's in the manual and if it's in the manual you're stuck with it when these are on there's a specific clearance which is set up round here which has to be set up when the blades are in feather of which these are set up to that dimension and if you all when you next walk out to your airplanes just look through the opening where the blade comes out through the spinner just to see if you've got these and don't be surprised if you don't have them as far as safety sake goes I would say they probably take them off because if you have these break across the bolt hole they usually exit the cut out in the spinner and very likely towards the fuselage <coughs> um, on a chieftain in fact I had one about 12 years ago that actually went through the fuselage and entered the cockpit um, missing the co-pilot's knee by inches which is an inherent danger with these things being spun and with damage from around the bolt hole which makes this retaining area down here super weak so it's probably better to not have them but you're stuck with them because the service manual says they're there and the parts catalogue shows them in the description you're stuck with them Alan, does it do any damage when you want to move your airplane to grab the prop and pull on it? Is it better to <coughs> push backwards on the wing than push the pull on the prop? When you remember that when your, your prop is running you've got all this force hanging forward on the blade tips, any pushing and pulling you do on the prop is obviously detrimental. Having said that, you will find everybody grabs hold of the prop, and if you're going to do it, do it as close to the hub as you can. Certainly don't hang on the prop tip and pull it forward. There is one other point. Every five years, I believe, four or five years, fifteen hundred hours. <coughs> we talk about that. The, uh, the options, uh, the AD versus overall. If you have an Aerostar which is being operated under the requirements of FAR 135, that basically says that you're going to comply with the manufacturer's recommendations. And the manufacturer's recommendations for the Hartzell prop is that every five years or 2,000 hours on this prop you're going to rip the prop to pieces and they're going to overhaul the prop if you are not flying part 135 you're, there is an AD on the prop which is 77.12.6 and the AD is probably one of the very original first ultra confusing ADs because it scans three pages and it's broken down into numerous paragraphs but the relevant paragraph that applies to this basically says that at the periods laid down in this service letter you're going to comply with this service policy and the service letter they quote is the time between overhauls and the service bulletin I believe is to do with hardening of the blade shanks so now you don't have to have the props overhauled at the five years but at the five year period you do have to comply with the ED it may make a difference of as much as a thousand dollars to you but to stay legal you have to do 77.12.6 you don't have to do the overhaul if you are part 135 you're stuck with the overhaul I can uh, add some personal uh, experience to that I, I was very uh, <coughs> curious as to what the uh, differences were uh, between a simple AD compliance even as a 591 operator and uh, a complete overhaul so I had a minor point 5 o'clock one morning and I flew to Hartsville in Pippa having made an appointment and they let me stay with the propeller all day while it was uh, while the AD compliance was uh, performed um, it was a uh, tremendously educational experience and the bottom line is that uh, there's very little difference whatsoever between a simple AD compliance and a complete overhaul. The essence of the difference is that um, with the overhaul you automatically get your blades repainted, restriped, uh, you get new heating elements installed since most of us do have at least top props on the aircraft and they also sandblast the hub to check for any subsurface corrosion but they told me they rarely find any subsurface corrosion that is not already evident on the surface of the hub. The uh, interesting thing was that uh, the propeller was completely disassembled. There were no two parts left together. I was there at 8, I was at 5, and that was one of the advantages, not only the educational experience, but the one-day turnaround, because I don't like downtime any more than the next time. Uh, the difference in price was even greater than the $1,000 that I mentioned. It's now as much as 
fifteen to seventeen hundred dollars per propeller. That is assuming that you don't need any parts as a result of the AD compliance inspection. Uh, theoretically, you could get out of parts sold for five or six hundred dollars and an AD sign off if you don't need any parts. Um, so, uh, in that most of you are Part 91 operators, you will just have to make a uh, personal decision as to whether or not you want to spend an extra uh, $3,000 to have both propellers overhauled as compared to simply having the AD compliance done, which in itself is about 95% of the overhaul. And I'll give one other perspective, and that is if it comes time to do a, an AD or an overhaul, uh, Mockham now says, forget that, put the 700 blades on here, um, fly the airplane much, much quieter, which it, which it really is. You can sit in there and talk um, and maybe get another two or 300 feet a minute rate of climb, which I find, that was the first thing I noticed on mine. And uh, the speed is about the same, but if you would like to be in an airplane that, that is now a normal sort of an airplane in terms of sound there's no question those props make a big big difference and then so just don't do the AD put that money towards the new props these are not entirely new props they're just new blades I think the interesting thing that I should add to all of that is if you stop and think about it matching props to blade tips so the blades are now shorter and then with their other mods the horsepower goes up so we were we were toying with the idea of taking a prop, cutting it off of this bench to see if we could make it an, uh, a Mac in 850. <laughs> okay. Um, with the ice boots on the prop, you're flying along and you turn your ice boots on and you get a low reading. You will, or you can see fairly easy by how low the reading, what sort of problem you have. If you've got one reading that is totally dead, when your prop cycles, these boots are set up into two sections. There's an outboard section and there is an inboard section, which applies to each one of these boots. When you turn your prop on, there is a sequence that it cycles. It will cycle the outboard half, then the inboard on one prop, then it will jump to the other side and go outboard, inboard. When you turn the system off, it's likely to end up anywhere along that cycle, and when you turn it on, it will continue that same cycle. So if the last cycle was the inboard parts of the boots were on. The next time you turn your boots on, and you can check this on the ground, and it's probably, it probably won't do you any harm if you're going to fly into ice in, but you should check this before you go and just put the master switch on, make sure you're not drawing in too much current and not all your nav lights and landing lights are on, and just put the prop the ice boots on and come around and feel them and just feel the boots. And if the first one that comes on is this outboard one, the next one that should come on should be this one. And then if you run over the other side and feel the outboard and the inboard, they should get hot as well. They'll come on, they'll last for a period of a time, I'm not sure if it's 30 or 30 seconds. They'll come on for 30, 35 seconds, and then that one will cycle off, and the next one will come on. If on one of those four cycles, at which point, when, the, when they're cycling, you can actually see the ammeter jump. Your little prop the ice ammeter will tick each time it changes the cycle. If it ticks to one cycle and you've got absolutely zero reading, it's telling you that none of the boots on this one prop are working. The chances of having three scrap boots is very remote, so it's highly like, highly like you're going to have a problem with brush. If the reading comes up but it's low, then you know that there's power to the boots, and obviously one or two of the boots have gone out. So that gives you a clue where you can have your maintenance start the troubleshooting. The prop is worked by a governor, of which this is a governor. It's not the aerostyle governor, but basically they're all the same. <coughs> Inside the governor, the housing portion that attaches to the engine is basically a high-pressure oil pump. Picks up the oil supply from the engine, boosts your 75, 80 psi up to somewhere between 250, 350. It transfers this oil up through what is called a pilot valve, which is in the center of this unit. From there, the governor then decides if it's going to send it to the prop or if it's just going to dump it back to the engine. What happens is when you apply takeoff power, your governor linkage is against the fine pitch stop, which, when your engine is running, allows these fly weights to fly outwards. 
I don't know if you can see it there, but when these fly, flyweights fly outwards there, which they do from the centrifugal force of these flyweights spinning round, as these flyweights spin round, they raise or lower the pilot valve that's inside. If your engine is over speeding, the flyweights obviously fly further apart because they're rotating with the engine, it's gear driven to the engine. When these fly further apart, the governor is saying to herself, it's going too fast, I've got to slow it down. So when the flyweights fly outwards, it raises the pilot valve, which the oil that was being directed to the prop is now being dumped back to the engine. And the oil that is in the prop gets dumped back through the pilot valve back to the engine. So in dumping the oil from the prop, the piston in the prop moves back down towards the hub, and your blades move coarser, and your RPM slows down. Now it slows down too much, and the governor says, I'm going too slow, speed up, speed up. So the flyweights, because there's now under speed, the flyweights move back in again. The pilot valve moves down, and now instead of the oil being directed back to the engine, the oil goes back to the prop, moves the piston in the prop forward, and the blades turn finer. So it speeds up. At the point of happy balance, the flyweights are floating about right in the center. The oil is not going to the prop. The oil is not coming from the prop. That is very basically how the governor works. How does it know what speed? When you adjust your prop lever in the cockpit, it moves the lever on the side of the governor, which you can see biases the spring on the, on the flyweights. That's how it's all worked out. On the end of the governor is your prop sink coil. It's basically just a solenoid. <coughs> the prop sink system picks up whether this prop has got to turn faster or whether this prop has got to turn slower. And it applies the voltage to this solenoid unit accordingly. It will say to the unit, I need more speed. So the flyweights have to come, they have to be able to fly out further. So when it says it needs more speed, it takes this center shaft and it moves the center shaft, which puts spring pressure on the flyweights so the flyweights are now biased in a certain direction. The shaft may move outwards, it may move inwards, and it will keep doing that until the prop sync computer has decided that everything's matched, and then it will just keep it there. It's not, it's not our intention to go into the deep mechanical way that every single thing on the airplane operates, but just to give you a shrewd idea of what's roughly in there and what happens when things go wrong, why do they go wrong. So we picked out some weak areas like vacuum pumps, pressure pumps. You've probably all gone through numerous pressure pumps. Everyone has. This is basically what's inside the pressure pump. It's a carbon center block with floating carbon vitamins. And this thing rotates around and theoretically works with the instrument system, works with the ice boot system. These veins, since they're carbon, as they're spinning around rubbing on the outside, they wear. <coughs> now they wear at a predetermined rate. When they wear, they give off black powder. I think you can just about see it there. If you disconnect or are into your pressure systems anywhere up to the filter in the cockpit, you will notice if you put your finger in the hose, inside the hose, everything's caked in this black dust. It's like coal dust. And this is where it originates, it's from where these veins were. <coughs> the problem is, because of the nature of this, you can see that when this is rotating, if anything jams in between those veins, it just shears the vein off. And once that vein breaks, the whole thing just self-destructs. That's one part of it. The other problem is that since these veins do wear, if your pump gets to be a high-time pump, the veins obviously come out further than they would normally do. And once it's out too far, the vein actually jams over and all on its own will just break, especially if it's a high-time pump. So that is basically what is in the pump. When this thing shears and breaks and smashes itself to pieces and fills your systems up with all this garbage, they decided that when this thing jammed, they didn't want to damage the engine. So some bright person said, why don't we put a little safety feature in there? So they came up with what they call a shear drive, which is basically just a nylon coupling, which is inside. If you have your mechanics look at the engine and your nylon coupling is broken, it's called the pump is shot the pieces inside it. What's the life expectancy on one of these pumps? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's several deciding factors in that. One of them can be how clean the system <coughs> was on the inlet side of the pump before the pump was put in. <coughs> If the inlet to the pump is not cleaned, your pump will probably last you about 30 seconds. If the inlet is cleaned but the inlet filter is not cleaned, it may last you an hour. If it's also dependent on the efficiency of, your, of the rest of the system in the aeroplane. When this is normally running and you're, you're not calling for the ice boots, so the only thing that is functioning in the aeroplane is the instrument pressure system, then this pump is being backed up with a pressure of about 5.7 psi, I think it is. What happens is when you select your de-ice boots, the valve closes and that pressure goes up to, I think it's about 18. So now you've got 18 pounds pushing back against these valves. Because of the angle, when they're being pushed back, they're being held hard against the walls, which generates heat and friction. Now the pump starts to run hot. And what will happen is, the faster it runs, the less, uh, the less time it's going to last. So the little detail that's on the side of all of these pumps is put on by airborne, and that little detail will change colour as the pump is overheated, which is their crafty way of knowing when you send it back for warranty failure that, sorry guys, it overheated, because they just look at their little placard. There is a warranty on the last pumps, I believe it's 400 hours or one year. There is a warranty on the smaller pumps which are used on the non-winged ice aero stars, which I think is a thousand hours or one year. <coughs> if you get a thousand hours out of one of the small pumps, you're doing real well. Alan, has anyone installed those aluminum veined air pumps? The aluminum veined air pumps right now, they don't have, they are made by a company called Sigmatech. They do not have a large pump approved at this time to go on the Aerostar. Had they have done so, I think we would have been a very large shareholder of theirs, but we have changed numerous of these pumps. I've had both go out at the same time. Sorry, the question was what happens if both pumps no, go out? I, did, I didn't. It's a fact. I've had both go out at the same time. Uh, it's highly likely that the problem was probably because of the manifold valve in the back of the cockpit. The Aerostar system uses a pressure pump on each engine. Those pressure pumps are plumbed in through the wings to relief valves. Relief valves that are set to open to power the, uh, the door seal. That same plumbing then goes from these relief valves into a manifold which is in the center of the or it's just off centre on the 176 panel in the back of the back of the cabin. The pump bit, the pump outlets from each engine come back into the manifold valve in the centre of the cabin and it goes from there off to a filter. So you can already see there is no filter between either of the pumps and the manifold in the centre. Inside this manifold valve at each end there is a little rubber flap that looks like a tongue and it just hangs down across the hole. And what happens is that the air pressure from your pump comes into the manifold valve and just blows the little tongue open. Now the air can come in and go to the various systems. And what happens is that over time with the dust wearing from the end of these veins, it builds up inside the manifold. <coughs> and it builds up to the point where the little flapper valve don't, doesn't close again. It can't because there's too much crud stuck underneath it. So now what happens is you start the engines and one of those valves is stuck open. Let's say for the sake of argument, the left valve is stuck open in your manifold. Now you, start in, you get in your airplane, you, you don't know anything about anything, you start the right engine first because you want to check systems on the right side. And what happens is your right pressure pump blows air through the systems of the manifold valve, out of the, open, the stuck open valve in the manifold valve, back through the other pump. You just build your other pump with garbage. Now you start your engine, what happens? You just lost your pump. <coughs> this is not the manifold valve we'll bring out and show you the proper one, but these little rubber diaphragms here are the little valves. And when you take this to pieces, it looks just like a tongue hanging down. And the tongue <coughs> hanging down just blocks the hole in there. And what happens, as I say, is the carbon from the pumps coming through here unfiltered. 
builds up inside this manifold valve, so the manifold valve gets filled with this black carbon dust. And over time, the little valve sticks open because there's so much carbon underneath it, it can't close. This is the Aerostar one, and this is what it looks inside. Now you can see inside it, look how black it is. It's absolutely jet black. And I'll pass this around, and down the inside of it, you can see the little tongue valve hanging down. And you can see the one in here is stuck open. Alan, could you just draw on the blackboard the schematic where it comes in, where these little valves are, so people can understand what, what you're talking about? Very well, basically, this is the two engine pumps. There's a filter on top of each engine, which is the inlet. And it comes from the pumps, into the wings, through the valves, the relief valves, sake of argument into this manifold valve which would represent this unit. <laughs> manifold valve has got two outlets in the centre, the diaphragms are each end and there is a small pipe coming off each side and, and the, the uh, back of valve is just there. And now what, and the, the only filter in the system is on the large pipe which is down here, so down here it comes down and goes to a filter and then goes off to your instruments the air that is coming into this manifold valve down here, if these little flapper valves stick open here, obviously when this engine is not working, you start this side, it blows the air through there, back out through this valve, and blows all the crud into your good pump. Uh, on the other hand, would it be possible during an annual to take that system apart and clean it up? Legally, you can't take this to pieces. We took this to pieces basically originally to see what was inside it and, and what there was to go wrong. It's a riveted together assembly. You can't take the thing to pieces. You could not buy new parts from it from airport. So you're basically stuck with a replacement, and this little thing is expensive. Why don't you tell them how they know when this isn't working right at the test? The two little pipes that come in from the sides, each one of these comes over to the instrument on the panel. Your pressure indicator, and on the bottom of it, you've got your two little red pips. If you start one engine and both of these pits vanish out of sight, they vanish out of sight because the air has gone straight through the manifold valve because the valve stuck open and that's why it's working both pits. If you see that, don't start the other engine. <laughs> it's going to cost you a thousand dollars. That's exactly what will happen. Yes. Well, if that doesn't happen, is the, can we assume that the, those little flapper valves are working correctly? Normally, yes, but the problem is if the, if the build-up on it occurs in flight, you're not going to know until your next startup if it's working. So now, let's say there you are flying along and your pump fails, and at that point the valve is now stuck open. You also run the risk, because that valve is stuck open, let's say this pump fails. This pump has now failed, and there you are at 15,000 feet. Because this valve is stuck open, you now run the risk of the air coming back out through this way. So you know, in the initial startup of well, the right engine, that your left valve is good, but when you start the left engine, you don't know if the right one's good. That's right. Yeah. I suggest to people that they start the engines alternately. I suggest to people they start the engines alternately. One start through the right one, and the next start through the left one. It's a great way of seeing what's happening to that valve. As I say, if this little tongue that hangs down inside sticks open, if you don't catch it, it's going to cost you a thousand dollars. But is a, it is something that you should be regularly monitoring on your uh, startups and also on your shutdowns. Uh, I think the overwhelming uh, majority of you are flying P models with door seals. You should not simply uh, inflate your door seal switch uh, or push the switch to inflate the door seals and assume that your door seals have inflated. Every single time that you lift the guard or you push the inflate button, your eye should immediately go over to the pneumatic pressure gauge, look for a uh, pressure increase. Uh, above uh, six inches of mercury, that should stay up there for five, six, seven seconds, and then it should immediately come back down to the middle of the green arc and stabilize. Uh, that is not the last time you should look uh, at that particular instrument. Uh, for example, if you're waiting 20 minutes for an IFR clearance and it's raining out, you've got your door seal inflated. Again, just because you 
uh, inflated it and you saw the needle go up and come back down, it doesn't mean it has stayed there. More than half of the Aerostars uh, I fly um, are unable at 800, 900, 1,000 RPM uh, to maintain full door seal pressure just the first time. So there's usually another excursion in the needle and a lot of times I've noticed that it does not come back down. So you're sitting there for 20 minutes with your air pumps running at uh, uh, higher temperatures, which again is going to lead to premature failure. It's a very uh, subtle but important instrument for you to be monitoring frequently in flight. Uh, another question that usually comes up at the annual Aerostar meetings um, is how often should the dorsal valve or how often should there be an excursion in needle in flight? Generally not more than once every 30 minutes. Some systems uh, are able to do it for three, four, five hours. I'd say uh, anything less than 30 minutes you ought to have some remedial action. Most of the aircraft uh, tend to be somewhere in that 30 to 45 minute uh, area. If it's more frequent than that, uh, one of the first things to check would be a air leak out of your door seal circuit. The other point I think that one of you gentlemen mentioned, and you've mentioned a lot of good points already, um, that pump is having to put out instead of 5.7 psi, when, you, when the door seal is demanding air, it goes up to 12 something. When your boots are demanding air, it has to go up to 18 something. And then there's a pressure switch. When it gets to 18, it says to the, to the regulator in the wing room, okay, everything's fine. We've got the 18 pounds. Let's shut it off. And then the, then the air pump, the pressure pump can relax again. But if you have a pinpoint leak in your boots and, and uh, the pumps work hard to get the pressure to build it up to 18, it only gets to 16 because there's a little leak out of there. And those boots just keep staying inflated at 16 and the system doesn't cycle. The boots don't shut off in five or six seconds. You're asking those pumps to keep working hard for that five, 10, 15 minutes until you realize, my God, my boots have to inflate it. So you should make sure within six seconds of the time that you turn your, your uh, inflation of your boots on, it should automatically, there should be a timer that it shut it off. If the timer's bad uh, and you've got a leak up there, you'll burn up your, your pumps pretty quickly, I'd imagine. You want to push that uh, button to inflate your door seal and the pressure, the, the wing root regulator opens up instead of pumping the air out below the wing. It'll put it into the system through that manifold and towards the door seal and also comes up towards the instruments. There's a regulator under the panel which keeps the pressure for the instruments at five point or whatever it is, five say, or five zero. Why then do you get that sudden jump? Is it a delay in the system? The regulator can't catch a hold of that and say, we don't want the pressure here for, uh, we want to stay five five in this area and it, it takes a while for it to push it back down. Uh, the reason that happens, if you look, if you the fake the system, <coughs> here's our little manifold valve and here's the inlets from the engine. This line comes down, goes through the filter, comes down here, and this goes off to the door solenoid valve unit. The pipe basically then goes down to the instrument system behind the panel. In this system, it goes through a regulator, which regulates the pressure for the instruments, I believe it's to 5.2. <coughs> what happens is that when you operate your door, when your door seal operates, there is such a large surge of pressure to the, the regulator behind the panel, it takes a few seconds to stabilize to, to reset its level to what the new, the higher setting is acting against. And conversely, when the, the door seal is now inflated and it shuts the system off, it takes a few seconds to reset its new position again, and that's why you see the delay. So you should get two, you should get a, a jump when the door seal starts to open up and then comes back. Probably, I think you see a jump both ways. How long does it take for the door seal to open up? Um, Five to ten seconds for the blow up? Oh, I'm not it's, sure. It's, uh, I've never timed it. Are you talking about the inflate or the deflate cycle? The inflate and then talk about the deflate. The, the deflate, the, the inflate on the tight system should be uh, uh, over and done with in five to seven seconds. The, de so the deflate, you will uh, rarely, if ever, see any kind of excursion on the needle. It remains stable and it uh, advances the 12 and a half pounds trapped in the pressure. Uh, in uh, two to three seconds. 
Yeah, so when I say I'm talking about a jump, I'm talking about when the system first goes up to 12 psi, yeah. and then when it stops to 12 yeah. psi, not when the door says it's open. So you should get two strokes and see what ones, and then you'll see it go up, and then you'll see it jump down. And then five or ten seconds later, those first two jumps, and that's where it's from. Yeah. From this regulator sensing its new position. How long does it take? If you shut your engine down and forget to hit your dump valve, your, your engines are now off. It takes much longer to the door seal to deflate, doesn't it? Is there a vacuum generated in that door seal? No, the door seal is physically trapped. The pressure is trapped by a valve. Okay. So you can shut your engines down, and then if your door seal system is good, it will stay inflated all day long. Okay, but if your mask is on, and then you hit the button, it should deflate you. Mm-hmm. And it will drain the system. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, if I remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you turn your power off, the door seal dumps. Correct. In the wintertime, it's a good idea to, to not rely on your mechanic all the time, but have a little can of silicone. Don't keep it in the plane because you've got a pressurization problem, but keep it in your car. Spray your door seal. Because when it's cold, your door seal will stick to the metal on the side. You've got to open your door in the wintertime in cold weather. You do damage to that door seal, which costs, depending where you buy it, $400 to $700 or something like that. It's an expensive piece of equipment. So if you just silicone that thing three or four times through the winter, just take a little spray, go right around the door seal. It, uh, it allows you to preserve the, the, the rubber. Uh, it's, not, it's not so much the preservation of the rubber, it basically just ensures that the seal doesn't stick to the door. Was, you probably, I'm sure you all have it sometime rather than it's every aeroplane. It's freezing cold, it's in the middle of the winter, the aeroplane's ice cold, you go out, you can't get the key in the door, you get the key in the door, it won't turn, finally you unlock it, you turn there, and you can't budge the door. And you can't budge the door because the seal has frozen itself to the door. Now you grab hold of it and give a real hard pull, you just rip the door seal. It's not cheaper to get a silicon spray and just spray it all around the door seal and you'll never have that problem. That's worth the price of admission to today, right, David? <laughs> <laughs> While we're on the subject of door seals, since there has been a, uh, a, uh, a rash of um, uh, cabin doors coming open and front recently, um, for those of you that um, don't know it, um, there's a uh, the door seal will hold the upper cabin door tight if the pilot has not actually rotated the D handle and inserted the pins through the fuselage structure. Uh, it will hold it until approximately 140, 150 knots in the climb out. At that point, there's uh, uh, the greatest likelihood that air pressure will, in fact, take the upper cabin door and open it. And on the P models, the upper cabin door hinge is strong enough that the hinge will actually hold the door to the aircraft. It will not separate in flight, but you will, nine times out of ten, uh, lose the upper cabin door mechanical strut or gas strut, depending on which ones you've got. This is a, um, a potential accident for uh, all of us, particularly in the summertime, when the temptation is to taxi around with the upper cabin door open. As you know, the upper cabin door on the P models fits very nice without any kind of slamming required to get it closed. So when you lower the door, it fits smoothly against the structure. Uh, The pilot gets distracted, inflates his door seal, and forgets to actually rotate the pins into the structure. Uh, That is the scenario which typically sets up an upper cabin door uh, emergency in flight. What I have been in the habit of doing for almost 20 years now of Aerostar flying is simply giving the door a couple of quick jabs with my left elbow, and it gives me uh, tremendous peace of mind in addition to visually inspecting all of the pins uh, and the actual position of the uh, D-handle. If I push on that door with my elbow, I'm pretty well assured that it is going to be closed. Um, The Aerostars will fly with their doors open. Uh, Obviously, it requires a cool, calm, and collected pilot to uh, fly the airplane, uh, communicate the problem, and then navigate back to the airport in that order, just like we learned when we were taking our basic flight training. Um, Keep the airspeed down. Uh, I cannot tell you personally what the air loads are if you try to reach up and pull the door down. Uh, I've not had it happen to me, so I can't tell you from personal experience. My inclination is that you should concentrate on flying the aircraft and do whatever it takes to get it back on the ground. 
the only thing I would the only other thing I would add about these pumps is you are far better off to change the pump before it fails because if the pump fails now you know you've already got the crud in the system and the final interesting thing that a lot of people don't realize is that when the pump is working it's basically it's inflating your system it's taking all the hoses and it's blowing them up like a balloon and that the second the pump <coughs> fails the balloon deflates and where does it deflate to? back to the pump so what happens is and it goes through the pump and it goes back out the way it came in so if this is your pump and here is the your inlet air filter which sits on top of the engine when your pump is running it's inflating this line supplying pressure downstream to the instruments, door seals, boots and all the rest of it when the pump fails these hoses which will be because of the pressure that's inside them bend the air back this way and the crud from the pump now comes back out this way and goes back into this filter so now you're standing there looking at the outside of the filter which is spotlessly white and inside the filter it's full of carbon now your mechanic comes along, puts a new pump on, takes this hose, cleans this hose out, puts your new pump on, starts the engine, and 30 seconds later, another thousand dollars. Because all the carbon that was inside the filter has just got sucked back into the pump again. So if this pump ever fails, insist that he change this filter. And the piece of hose between the filter that they use is a piece of scat hose, it's a corrugated hose, real difficult to clean out, and this hose is probably six inches long. Forget the cost, tell put a new hose on as well. It's three quarter inch scat hose. It's cheaper to change that little piece of hose and that little twenty-four dollar filter than it is to argue with the mechanic about another thousand dollar pump. Any time there's a chance of contamination going into the system, there are only two filters in the system. One is this one, which you've got to change. And the other one is the one downstream that catches any garbage before it gets to the instruments. This filter, I think, only gets changed at 500 hours. If you run at risk of any contamination going in there into the system whatsoever, they should clean out this hose, they should take a little manifold valve off, a little thousand dollar spender, I should take the manifold valve off, clean the valve out, and I should change the downstream filter as well. It's going to save you more potential problems. So, we'll go back to the engine again, and we'll carry on going through the engine accessories. Um, we'll, we'll play back with the engine fuel system for a while. The heart of the engine fuel system is the Bendix injector servo. <coughs> the Bendix injector servo, of which this is one. And if anyone's desperate enough to know what's inside it and what makes it tick, that's time I'll rip it to pieces and show you. But, but this is basically what it is. Fits on the back side of the engine. Measures the air that's going into the engine and meters the fuel accordingly. <coughs> when it meters the fuel, it sends the fuel down a pipe to this little magic unit, which is called a manifold valve or a flow divider. The flow divider's function is to then meter the fuel out to the nozzles, minus the springs. And basically this is what is in the flow divider. It's a, it's a diaphragm with a little miniature spring and when the engine is running, the centre unit basically just moves up and down until you get to a set fuel pressure and it lets the fuel come out to the nozzle pipes. <coughs> When you get to a high fuel flow rate, this thing is fully open and then the fuel that is flowing to the nozzles is just governed by the restriction that each nozzle causes. This being one of the nozzles. You can have all sorts of problems with these nozzles which at the extreme can write your whole engine off. So this tiny little brass thing is ultra important. They come in specific sizes and they're usually stamped on the outside with what size they are, which is an indication of the, of the flow rate. <coughs> and what normally happens with these nozzles is that dirt that is in the system goes into the nozzle and plugs up this little tiny hole that's inside the nozzle. And it is a real small hole. I'll cast some of them out. If you just hold it up and look through it lengthwise, you'll see it's a tiny little hole you're talking about. Yeah. 
you see, it's one tiny little hole. No way it can consume 25 gallons an hour. It's, <laughs> it, it's, a real, it's a real small yeah. hole. You can see from the size of the hole how easy it is to block it up. Now you can end up in the situation where dirt has gone into your nozzle and if the nozzle is in a cylinder that doesn't have a CHT and doesn't have an EGT you might not know anything about it but you can have one cylinder that is running horrendously lean you can have it where it's, where it's to the point you've got detonation in the cylinder then you'll probably know about it when it gets to a real advanced state <coughs> your only indications are going to be what your fuel flow and your fuel pressure gauges are reading but these little things are very important 100 hourly we always take these out and we put these in the sonic cleaner you may just want to make sure that when you have your 100 hour done on your engines that you specifically ask did you clean the nozzles the problem is again that even with time these things build up carbon so when you look at one that's in service it's just the bottom of it and the inside of it is just black, black and filthy so even though it may not actually be blocked because of the carbon it's restricted and if there's a restriction you've got less fuel going through it and less fuel going through it means your cylinder is running leaner so now you're in the situation where it's running slightly leaner and you're not necessarily aware of it now you're in cruise, you go to set up your fuel flows on your EGTs and you lean the engine a bit more now this cylinder is running even more leaner <coughs> and because of the restriction that this nozzle is, is causing you've now got more fuel going to the other nozzles so your indication from that side of the engine is that it's running too rich so you lean a bit more and this cylinder is already running too lean and the leaner this runs because the, more the, because the nozzle is getting blocked up the more this one's blocked the more fuel you've got going to the other nozzles so on this hand the engine is saying well I'm running, I'm running way too rich and you start leaning and there's this poor little cylinder dying of starvation you, re you really need to make sure that every hundred hour you get these nozzles clean well, you can get to the point where the cylinder runs so hot, uh, you can cause all, all sorts of nasty damage. You can have a cylinder that detonates, and it can just smash your piston to pieces. Because when you get detonation, instead of a smooth flame front moving across the mixture that's in the cylinder, all of a sudden it goes bang, and you just get a tremendous explosion, which is a very rapid build up in temperature and with that goes a, a real rapid build up in pressure and the piston is not designed to take that sudden shock which is like someone smashing on the piston crown with a sledgehammer and potentially it can smash your cylinder to pieces your fuel pressure on the engine comes from an engine driven fuel pump of which this is one um, it's directly geared to the engine receives pressure from the fuel system boosts it up and sends it out to Bendix injector. Just undo those two screws and take them out from <coughs> We discovered something real interesting about these pumps last year which I thought was so dangerous and so risky that five minutes after we found it I phoned the FAA and told them I thought they should send out an emergency bulletin on it because it was so dangerous we had an aerostar come in and one of the owner's requests was that the fuel pressure was too low would we adjust it which on the surface is a fairly simple adjustment it's just a question of slackening the lock nut and adjusting the adjustment in the center of the lock nut tightening the nut back up again and re-safety wiring it we cut the safety wire on the, on the lock nut, we undid the lock nut, we adjusted it. This is while it was in the hangar on, in pieces during an annual. We adjusted it what we thought would be the right amount, tightened the nut up, safety wired it, and carried on with the rest of the inspection. And of course we'd had the nozzles out, so when we put it all back together, we had to prime the system with the fuel pumps to check for leaks. When we turned the boost pumps on, <coughs> so much fuel gushed out the bottom of this pump that within about I'm going to say within about three seconds there was probably four cupfuls of fuel all over the floor we couldn't believe this fuel just sprayed everywhere 
And what had happened was that this bottom housing is attached to the rest of the unit with four screws, and in between the two there is a rubber seal. I'm not sure if it's just a gasket or if it's a diaphragm, but either way it's a rubber seal. And what happens with these pumps over time is that the, the unit is initially torqued down when the rubber is at a certain age. And over time, the rubber crushes down. And unknown to us, when we had disturbed this bottom nut, because the rubber had closed down, the, sc the screws were no longer tight. Yeah, they were still safety wired, just like this one is. But the screws weren't tight anymore. So what had happened was, when we touched this nut, we broke the bottom housing free from the gasket. As I say, even though the screws were still safety wired, so as far as we were concerned, it's tight. We took the safety wire off the screws and realized that all the screws went off about another half a turn. But what had happened was our action of touching this bottom nut and touching this bottom housing had moved the housing just enough to break the housing free from the seal. Now there you are at 15,000 feet and vibration breaks your housing loose from your pump and you've got you know, a million gallons of hours spraying out straight down the back of the engine. We've now started our own little procedure as every time we have the counties off an aerostar and it's in for an inspection, we go up there, we chop the safety wire off and we check tighten these screws. That's all it takes. Where the pump attaches to the engine on the drive pad, there is a drain hose that comes from the pump, which comes from this bottom unit. And they put that there for two reasons. One is that if the seals in the pump should fail, the gas that is going into the pump could leak forward into the engine, so what they do is they vent it overboard through a drain. Equally so, if the seal on the engine side of the driving pad should go, it would pump this area full of oil, so now the oil would come out overboard. So the point is, if you ever see fuel coming out of the drain that originates from this pump, you shouldn't fly the airplane. Because it means your pump gasket is gone, and it's just pumping, instead of the fuel going to where it should be going off, it's coming out the front and going out your overboard drain. Apart from the, flight, the, apart from the fire risk, you shouldn't fly it. Well, that's the important thing on this pump. Those, these four screws, if they come loose, can be a real killer. <coughs> and it's not something you can argue about. If they're loose, they're a killer, and that's all there is to it. One of the things about the, that little fuel drain that comes down that little black uh, tubing that comes from the pump, uh, it would be a good idea to make sure it does indeed come out through the hole in the cell. A lot of times they get stuck in the bottom, and I've read uh, one fellow who uh, went to start his engine, the hose wasn't actually out. He had this leak, and he had a quart of fuel uh, lying in the cell area at the bottom. It'll catch it underneath there, and he blew everything to smithereens when he started his engine. So the, the purpose of the drain is to get it away from the engine, at least. So uh, it's a hard way to find out that you have a problem with your, with your pump, but uh, don't, don't complicate matters by just letting that fuel drain into the engine area and have, a, have an explosion. Okay, let's go back to the Bendix injector. <coughs> Anyone here had the problem when they shut the engine down and it keeps ticking on? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Alright, the problem is caused because in the side of the Bendix injector where the mixture control attaches, which this is the inside part, on the end of that arm, there's a little tiny plate, which is this plate, and the plate's got a little tiny slot in it. Yeah. This little steel plate seats against the brass plug that's inside it. And what happens is if dirt goes in the injector, it scores up the plates. So now, although this may be closing off the orifice, the fuel is still going through through the scores. If the mechanic takes this part out and there's no scores, then what happens is the brass plug that's in there around the outside of, the, of that brass plug is an o-ring and if your engine doesn't shut down and this plate and this plate is not scored the fuel is leaking past the o-ring that's in that center body <coughs> you don't have to send the injector away you don't even have to take it off the engine you can do all this on the engine it's just a question of undoing the mixture control arm two screws and he can pull the unit right out and he's looking right at the plate you shut the mixture down and it starts to die, picks up, starts to die, picks up and what's happening is you've told the engine to stop introducing fuel you've told the injector to stop introducing fuel and it tries to but because of the scores or the leaking seal it keeps putting through just enough for the engine just to keep on 
The other thing with the Bendix injector is it's, a, it's like a dual system. There's a fuel meter in section and there's a diaphragm section. Um, the fuel meter in section is this end where the, the, the filter is, where the controls are both attached. The other section is where the diaphragms are. And you can, this is the edges of the diaphragms that you're looking at here. In the end of the injector, there are two methods that the injector diaphragms pick up their information. One is from these tubes that are sticking forward. And these tubes that are sticking forward, they're called impact tubes. They sense the pressure that is coming out of the turbos going into the servo. <coughs> In the neck of the Venturi in there, there's a ring that's cut all the way around it with holes around the outside of the ring. That senses the air rushing through the Venturi, that senses the pressure there, so there's a balancing force there. If there's a problem with the diaphragms, of which you usually get absolutely zero warning, what happens is if the diaphragm leaks, it starts pumping gas back out of the impact tubes where air should be going in. So now what happens is your engine's running super rich and you can't understand why. And you can play with your mixtures all day long and it still keeps running super rich. And what's happening is your diaphragm's gone or the center seal has gone and it's coming back into the diaphragm side and the fuel is leaking back out of the impact tubes. If that happens, there's nothing you can do except get the injector off and it's got to be fixed. The only two areas on the injector that usually leak is if a diaphragm goes or the center body seal between the diaphragms, which is one is, side, one is fuel and one is the air diaphragm. If the center body seal leaks, so it crosses from one section to the other section, it will leak into the injector. And if the diaphragm actually goes, it will leak out through the impact tubes. <coughs> if either of those things will happen, your engine runs awful. It runs way too rich, and if it's really leaking bad, your engine will sit there smoking like anything. doesn't matter what you do with the mixture. It will sit there running super rich. Again, you get absolutely no warning. As far as the Bendix injector is concerned, it either works perfectly, or it will do real strange things at altitude, or it's totally no good. When you're shutting down your engine, uh, you've got your mixtures in the closed position. After you're all shut down everything, just crack your mixtures forward just a little bit, and you'll see the uh, fuel pressure drop down, and that takes pressure off of the diaphragm, diaphragm as well. The only, thing I, the only other things I would add about the Bendix servo, since there's really very little you can do with it, if, you, if your engine is at idle, or 1000 RPM, and you pull the mixture control back very, very, very slowly, just before the engine starts to die, you should see the RPM come up and then just die off. <coughs> the fact that the RPM is coming up is telling you what the mixture is doing at that stage and it needs to be set so that when you pull your mixture control back you get an increase of maybe 25, maybe 50 RPM. That shows that as you pull it back, you're leaning the mixture, the RPM goes up as you, as the, as you lean it a little bit more and then it dies off. If that ever needs adjusting because either you get a massive rise or you don't get any, if you get no rise at all before your engine dies, which is something you can check at the end of every flight as you shut down, just pull the mixture back real slow and watch the RPM should go up and come down. If it doesn't go up at all, your mixture is running too lean and you run the risk of having an engine that's going to be hard to start, especially in the winter. If you pull the mixture control back slowly and the RPM suddenly goes up 200 RPM, now your engine's running so rich at idle, you can do is fail your plugs and you're wasting gas. So ideally you want it set to about 25 RPM and it's really easy to adjust. All that has to be adjusted is this little knurled ring. And right on the side here, it's usually marked with an arrow, rich. So it tells you which way to turn it. You're actually looking for the richest you can get it, but with it still running smoothly. Um, on a Continental, for instance, they will tell you to set it as rich as possible with no increase. Lycoming, I believe, tell you to set it somewhere between 25 and 50. You're looking for a happy medium where if you push the throttles open rapidly, it responds because it's not too lean or too rich to kill the engine. You don't want it running too rich because all that's going to happen is any time you're idle, you're just fouling your plugs. And if it's too lean, this is where you get your starting fuel from. So now when you try and start, it's not going to want to start. So you're looking for a happy medium. And the happy medium usually runs about 25, 30 RPM. 
but the point is you don't have to be a mechanic to see it. When you go to shut the engines down with the pumps turned off, just pull the mixtures back very, very slowly, one at a time. And just before the engine dies, the RPM should go up and come down. And if it goes up 25 to 30 and comes down, your mixture is just right. Well, 50 is fine. The other thing is because of the nature of the Bendix injector, it can give you some real strange symptoms, as we found out a few months ago. <laughs> if you are in the situation where, for whatever the reason, your Bendix injector is not sensing turbo pressure, what happens is that you open the throttle, and in opening the throttle, it's opened the mixture plates and it's opened the throttle plate in here. Now the unit is set up on the bench so that at X throttle position, when it's given X amount of fuel flow, the diaphragms are going to be in X position. <coughs> and it's set up on the bench to act just that way. Now what happens is that you're running the engine, and let's say for a st stuck wastegate, stuck open, The injector doesn't sense the higher pressure from the turbo, but the throttle is still open. So the throttle is dumping more gas into the engine because the diaphragms are not moving to reduce it to the correct amount. So now what happens is you're in a situation, you're sitting there with your nice turbocharged engine, and you're opening the throttle, and all that's happening is it's getting richer and richer and richer, and the engine starts to die. And the problem's not a fuel system fault, it's a turbo system fault. Because what's happened is, for the sake of argument, your wastegate is stuck fully open. The Bendix injector, remember, has been calibrated on the bench so that when the throttle lever position is at, a certain, is at this position, it expects to see the diaphragm somewhere in this range. But because your wastegate's stuck open, you don't have your full upper deck pressure coming in here. So the diaphragms don't move. So what happens is you still get pressure in the venturi, but you've got no pressure to the impact tubes, which biases the diaphragms and screws the whole thing up. So now what happens is you're opening your throttle, and all that's happening is your RPM or speeds up to a certain point, <coughs> maybe 1800 RPM, and the engine's just running richer than hell. And you keep opening the throttle, and suddenly the engine's blah, 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 and it starts to kill itself. And yet it's not a fuel system fault. The fault is the turbo system. If you ever see symptoms like that, a real quick way of proving it is just grab the mixture control and pull the mixture back. Because if that is the fault, when you pull your mixture control back and put the engine back to its correct position, it will it'll accelerate and come back up again. It won't run as a turboed engine, it will run as a normally aspirated engine. But, it will, but the RPM will pick back up. So if you ever see a symptom like that, the way the, your fuel flow seems uh, your fuel flow is high, your engine RPM is low, your throttle position is going towards wide open and the engine is just dying, pull the mixture control back. If you pull the mixture control back and everything picks up, that's, your, that's what your problem is. Your problem is that your Bendix servo is not sensing the right upper deck pressure it should, and that may be because you've got an exhaust problem, or the wastegate's not closed, or the wastegate's stuck, or the actuator's not working, but it's not sensing the correct upper deck pressure. So this is our famous Bendix Magneto. Masterpiece. What we've done at great expense, we went out and bought one of these mags, and we chopped the thing in half. And then having chopped it in half, we put new points in it, and we retimed it, and we put it all back together so it works. <coughs> We took an old starting vibrator, played about with that, cleaned it up, changed a few parts in there, and that's, so now we've got a starting vibrator that works. The Aerostar's got two of these, and they're on the 176 panel, and they both live in the lower right hand, the lower left hand corner as you're looking back at the panel. Without these things, you just won't start your engines, so you're really not very going very far. I don't know if anybody's ever noticed it, but when you look at your circuit breaker panel, your CHT circuit breakers are labelled CHT and start. So without realising it, your CHT system is a grounding item. Because if you get a short in your CHT system and the CHT breaker just trips, you can't start your engines because it's just removed power to your vibrators. The problem is, if you get a short in your CHT system, you just can't fly. 
You can't fly till someone fixes it. We've taken an Aerostar switch. Your starter switch. And we've wired it up basically how it is in the aeroplane to show you exactly what it's doing. The first thing is there's a real big misconception about what the engine is actually running on when it's pointing to L or R. <coughs> when your switch is pointing to the right, it means it's running on the right. That means it's switched off the left. When it's pointing to the left, it's running on the left, which means it's turned off the right. So now you're in a situation where you've just landed and you do your final mag check before you shut down the engine and you turn the selector to the left and you don't get a mag drop. Which is the bad mag? Anyone? Right, the right one because the right one it should have just turned off. And if, it does, if you don't get a drop, the right one hasn't turned off. Very, very often we found that an owner will appear and say, my right mag's live. And you say, why? He said, because when I select it to the right, there's no mag drop. When he selects it to the right, it's switching off the left mag. So if there's no drop, there's nothing wrong with the right mag that the mechanic's just wasted an hour trying to fix. It's the wrong mag. Is there any damage to the airplane when you're checking your mag drop at the end or your P-lead check at the end just to totally shut it off briefly and then bring it back online and the whole engine should, should quit on you? If it doesn't, you know, one of those is it's alive. Right. It's very prudent to do that. It's and prudent to do anymore. that, but you've got to do it at real low RPM. Right? We do it at idle. If you're doing this specifically a higher power setting and you just shut everything off totally and turn it all back on again, yeah, you could have problems. But you can accomplish uh, the same thing just by going to each one and looking for a drop. The drop, if your ignition system is real good, you may not see a drop in RPM. In which case, if you see no drop, look at the manifold pressure. If you don't see a drop in RPM, you should see a change in manifold pressure. It should creep up and then come back down again. Well, when doing a uh, mag ground check, just before you, you're about to pull back your, uh, your mixture to shut off your engines, but that basic idle, which is like 950,000, something like that, you're <coughs> saying it's, it's okay to uh, just quickly to wait maybe a half a second to hear. Just, yeah, just turn the mag right off. Turn right on and back on again. And that's I wouldn't even do it at 900. I'd put it right back to either. Whatever your things are riding at, just for a split second go. Both left, right, off, and back on again. The engine should die. If it doesn't die, you've got a live mag. Should you turn your fuel boost pumps off at that point? Uh, you would just do your normal shutdown procedure, but the last thing before pulling the mixtures is yeah. just turn the mags all the way off and back on again. Yeah. If the engine keeps running, you already know before you start you've got a live mag. Yeah. Uh, and the problem is, if it's on the left mag, now you're not going to be able to start the engine. So what's going to give you a live mag in the beginning is now it's going to give you a non-start, and you may not have realized it. So you think to yourself, all right, I've got a live mag, so what big deal? Now you come out the next day, you've got all your family with you, it's freezing cold, you all load up, jump in your airplane, get it the ice, climb in, it won't start. And you knew it wasn't going to start, of course you had a live mag on the left mag. And on here, we're going to try and make you understand why this happens. So we took the system that's basically in the Aerostar, we took the switch, we took the vibrator, we took an Aerostar mag. <coughs> this was a right mag that only had one set of points. We chopped it in half, we modified it, we put the second set in to make this the left mag. So this would represent the left mag that's on the airplane. When you turn your switch all the way around and you move it to the both position, the switch is actually doing three things without you realizing it. It's turning off the right mag. The reason it does this is that the firing position of your mags with your engine is at, I think it's 25 degrees before tap center. When you're starting your engine, you don't want it to, to fire 25 degrees before top center. It's turning over too slow. It will just kick it backwards. So you want to delay it till after top center, when the piston is now past its upstroke and about to come down on its downstroke. The right hand mag only has one set of contacts in it and it's set, or it should be set on the engine for timing of about 25 degrees before top center. So the first thing the switch does is when you go to the position, it turns off the right mag. And it turns off the right hand mag basically by taking the wire that goes to the magneto, the P lead or the switch lead, they're both the same thing, and it just puts it straight to ground. By putting that P lead to ground, it just turns that mag off. So the first thing you've accomplished is you've made your right hand mag dead. The right hand mag is now out of the circuit. 
the second thing the switch does is it engages the solenoid that goes to your starters the third thing it does is in doing that it makes the circuit so that when you've engaged the solenoid for your starter motors power can now come from the outlet side of that solenoid back to the starter vibrator and it all does this through the connections on the back of the switch if there's a problem with a switch unless you're real handy forget trying to fix it because when you're in the airplane there's an extra four wires on this thing so if there's a problem with a switch you're going to be stuck until the mechanic fixes it for you when you operate the switch and now you've operated it to both you're in your start position you've turned off the right hand mag you've engaged the starter so now the starter is now turning the engine and the last thing is it engages the vibrator <coughs> when you engage this vibrator the vibrator has inside it some contacts I don't know if you can see them there little tiny moving contacts okay the contacts that are inside the magnet that are inside the vibrator are acted upon by quote basically an electromagnet <coughs> the electromagnet is in series with the contacts so what happens is power comes down through the contact to a coil and out of the other contact when there is power flying it energizes the coil which now turns the center core into a magnet and the magnet pulls the contact down now as it does that it breaks the circuit and the second it breaks the circuit the coil loses its power and what was a magnet is now not a magnet so the contact jumps back up again it does this real quick and so of course as it does it now instead of the contact being a straight open and close it's a real rapid open and close and it vibrates open and closed real real rapid there's very little current going through it but if anyone ever touches the P lead while they're checking this you'll jump experience I promise you you'll jump that same wire is then led on to it goes back to the switch and it comes out the switch in two places through two wires it comes out through the P lead wire or the switch lead wire and it also goes to what's called the retard breakers I always treat retard breakers as a red herring and I'll explain to you why when the magneto is starting the sole purpose in life of these retard breakers is just to delay the spark they don't do anything else inside the mag they are not connected to anything all they do is delay the spark because if the mag just had the same one set of contacts that the other mag had in it it'd be fine at this 25 degrees before center which is way too early so what they do is they bring the power down two wires this is the power from the vibrator it comes down both wires at the same time it comes down the switch lead and it also comes down the retard lead <coughs> when the primary breakers open there's still nothing happening because the vibrator is still shorted out through the retard breakers when the retard breakers open now you've removed the short from the system so the power that was coming down the switch lead now completes its job and goes continues on from the circuit breaker term from the contact breaker terminal into the coil inside the mag and that stop go stop go stop go on the current then puts a pulse through the, the, the coil inside the mag which then induces the high voltage in the second in the, the, the high tension coil which then passes it out to the plug basically when you're starting the engine if it all works this is should be what you see If you look inside the mag, you can see when you press the starter button, this is what's happening inside the mag. See that? that is what's called a shower of sparks. You can see it jumping from the finger to where the lead is. At the same time, you can see what's happening at the spark plug. The mag can be a crazy thing and it can drive you absolutely nuts with some of the problems it can come up with. 
anybody here had problems where they get this real rough mag drop and specifically at altitude and then they come down and it all goes away again? I'm surprised you all say no, it has to be one of the most common things that ever happens inside a mag. But what happens is that the spark, which is coming from the top of this finger here, jumps across to the electrode and then theoretically it should come out of the lead to the plug. But what happens is the spark that comes out of here is so powerful that if I turn this round so there is no lead for it to go to, and we get to the right position. That spark will just come to the nearest ground and you can see it there, it's going straight across. Where that spark is, I don't know if you can see it, it's burnt a line. It does that inside the distributor block. So what happens is instead of the spark going from here to the electrode and out the wire, it will go from here to the electrode and out this wire and if there's any moisture inside the mag it will find another path to go and if the, if the moisture path it takes is to the next lead it will go to the next lead and if the moisture path and tracking is all the way round it will go all the way round and you don't know it but you're firing all six plugs the same second this is not from one of these mags it's from another mag but this is an example of exactly what happens I'll pass it round for you to have a close look at. This one has actually burned all the way round. It's gone round in a complete circle and he had all five, four plugs firing at the same time. And he knew it was running all rough but he didn't know what was happening and he carried on flying with the mag turned on. Let me pass it round for you to look at. If you have a problem, specifically when you're at altitude and your engine starts running all rough and all lumpy and horrible, <coughs> providing you're not at full power, do a mag check. When you do your mag check, if you find that you've got this real rough running on one mag, not a steady drop, a rough running where your mag drop is going to be up and it's going to be down, up and down and it pops and bangs, turn the mag off. Don't carry on running with a rotten mag running because you run the risk of totally destroying your engine because you're firing everything out of sequence. If you ever end up in that position, see which mag is causing the problem and just turn the damn mag off. When we had this case with this magneto, I said to the owner, did you realize it was the mag? And he said, yes. And did you turn it off? He says, no, what, and run on one mag? You're only running on one mag when you've got this situation. You're running on one mag and you're firing all the mixtures as it's coming into the cylinder. You're totally screwing up the way the engine operates and you're causing all sorts of potential nasty expensive problems. If you ever have this rough running specifically at altitude and then it goes away when you come back down, it's highly likely that that is going to be the cause of the problem. And if that happens, switch the mag off. Just run on one and when you land, get it fixed. Alan, you may want to caution the uh, audience that uh, when you are running on a single mag, then the propensity to run hotter by as much as 25, 50, 75 degrees. And if you're already running at uh, best economy, which is defined as PPGT, you may find yourself on the lean side, which of course is going to set yourself up for a detonation, detonation, etc particularly important at the high altitude. So if you find yourself running on a single mag, um, uh, go ahead and enrich the mixture somewhat to compensate for the less efficient combustion which is occurring inside the cylinder. Yeah, that's very true. If you end up in a situation where you need to switch off a mag and just run on one, scan the engine instruments real carefully and if you see the engine is running hot, put some more fuel in it, let it run a bit cooler. Yeah. Why is the engine running hot when it's on the other one? Because what is happening when both spark plugs in the cylinder are operating? Here's your cylinder and here's the two spark plugs. 
And usually what happens is when the mixture is in the cylinder, the spark plugs burn and you get like a line that travels across through the mixture and it burns as a steady mixture from both of the spark plugs in towards the centre. And now when the, ex when the exhaust valve opens, all the mixture is burnt. What happens is when you're only running on one mag, instead of the mixture burning as it should, it's now burning much slower because it's only been ignited from one side. So now what happens is your exhaust valve opens and what rushes outside is still burning. The mixture that's gone through the exhaust valve is still burning. So what happens is it's now hotter when it gets to the exhaust pipe, but your EGT has now gone up. So you run the risk of burning your exhaust valves and doing it's damage. Well, it's not only that, but you're making the whole area hotter because it's now running right. in in an unsatisfactory way. So right. you need to do basically do everything you can to keep the to keep the temperature down. If you go out to the airplane and you go to start the engine, <coughs> and the engine turns over fine, but it just doesn't start. There's a few things it could be, and, and all of them give you strange symptoms. If when you went to shut down your engine you had a live mag, if your live mag is the left mag, you won't start, and you won't start it because to have a live mag, for whatever the reason, you've disconnected the switch lead. You've disconnected this wire. Now when I say disconnected, it could be that it's broken, it could be that the switch is packed up, it could be that it's pulled out of the little crimp, but it means the wire is not connected to the mag. By disconnecting this wire, the mag will never do anything. The mag is going to be stone dead. Because this is the final wire where the power comes down to go to the mag. At the same time, before you shut down, you're going to know that the engine carried on running because your mag was still alive and you couldn't shut it down on the mags and when you did your final check to off, the engine keeps running. If it kept running and it was on the left mag, this is why there's a problem with this wire. And the engine won't start. If, for any reason, the retard wire breaks, you're still going to start your engine and your mag will act normally. Your mag is still going to be like a normal mag, you're going to turn it off and, and it's all going to die and, and go off. But what's going to happen is now when you go to start the engine, you've removed the delay that the timing had because of the retard breakers. So now what happens is you go to start the engine and instead of firing off the top centre, it's going to fire before. So you press your starter button, the prop starts to turn over, it fires and it kicks backwards. If you're going to start and it kicks backwards, don't start it because now you you run an awful risk that if you get a real horrendous kick back really at the wrong moment, you can risk breaking the crankshaft because you've got the mass of this prop being spun on the front and all of a sudden the pistons stop it dead and spin it the other way. So the prop still wants to turn this way, the pistons are trying to turn it the other way and the weak point is the crankshaft right behind the prop flange. If you ever get a real nasty kickback, get it looked at before you try and start it. And if you do get a kickback, either the retard wire is broken or the retard breakers are not working. Once the engine is going, you could disconnect the whole retard system right away because it's not involved. <coughs> Comment on the... Uh I don't know if any of you have seen the inside of the ignition switch, but all that is is little aluminum pieces in there. And you all know what aluminum does. It wears, and you might get little shavings in the switch itself that sometimes can choke the whole thing out and you can actually turn it too off. And the engine might still be running, but it's not the ground fault that can be in the switch itself. What Pat is talking about is the contacts in the switch, the three little aluminum triangles, and each one's got a little pip on top. And when you rotate the switch around, these three pips and the housing they're in get rotated. So your connection is these little pips. 
and they put a special lubricant inside it so that the thing doesn't just wear. <coughs> and what happens is, with the lubricant and with the sweat and with the wearing of the contacts, you also get a build-up of dirt inside there. So now you get to the point where you've actually got no electrical connection from the little terminals up to the plate. So as well as it there, so you're highly likely to have uh, a live mag because you've lost your electrical connection so you won't be able to turn the mag off. But again it could be the switch. But as I said to you earlier, if you have a problem and you suspect the switch, forget playing with it. It's a pain in the neck. And when you get it to pieces you have to stand and delicately balance it to get it all back together again because each one of these little triangles has got a spring underneath it. It's not a good game if you've got shaky hands. <coughs> As far as the mag itself is concerned, inside the mag there's just basically a magnet which rotates. There's what's called pole shoes, which is the pole shoes and they just go either side of the magnet. And the pole shoes go right the way around, through the middle of the coil, around the other side to the magnet. When the magnet rotates, flux, magnetic flux comes from the magnet through the pole shoes, through this here, which is the centre of the coil, back round into the other magnet. It's like a horseshoe magnet. When you put a bar across the horseshoe magnet, the magnetic flux goes all the way round and through the bar, which is what happens here, but instead of a bar, we've put a coil across. So as the flux is going through and changing direction, it induces voltage in the coil. When the points open, that stop of current flow induces a voltage in the secondary coil and that's how you get a spark. The distributor block that's in it, of which this is the Aerostar one, <coughs> they've had all sorts of problems with these things. If it's a green one, you have to do certain things to the mag. If it's a brown one, you have to do certain things. If it's a black one, you have to check the date stamp on it. And the problems with all of these things are the same, but just like that little one I handed around, that's what happens to the big one. Once these things start arcing, there's nothing you can do with them. Just as a comment, the uh, mechanic had pointed out to me that uh, it's important that there not be too much grease on the felt in the center there, and that it be uh, properly clean when it's in place. <coughs> And again, if you can take the time to uh, uh, observe some of those things with your mechanic, it, it really heightens your, your level of knowledge and awareness, especially if you're out in the field and uh, you've got a mechanic who's never seen an aerostar before. Uh, being aware of these details, not only this, but others, can make a major difference. Uh, are there some other things to be aware of uh, when that we can do anything about? Yeah, there is a few things. When the airplane is next in for an inspection, they're going to check the contact breakers. And to check the contact breakers, it means they have to take this top plate off the mag. And in taking the top plate off the mag, when they disconnect this plate, this very top one that holds the leads, when you lift it up, off comes this rubber block. And this rubber block has got little towers that all fit into these. Before they put it back together, have them just get some silicon grease and smother it all around the towers. Because otherwise what happens, and it gets all the airplanes sooner or later, is just like the spark jumped across here, the spark comes up the inside of the tower and goes to the casing of the mag, and it burns a track inside the cap, and it burns this rubber block. Now you have to take the whole thing to pieces and you have to disconnect it from all the leads just to put another block on where silicon grease on all of the towers to start with would have solved the problem. It will especially happen if any moisture goes in here. If this thing gets within 100 yards of moisture at arc. How much voltage are we talking in there? The average mag runs... The load on the mag depends on the gap of the spark plug, what the compression is. It will be at the spark plug anywhere from 11 to 18,000 volts. But as I say, it's, it's an undefined because it depends on the spark plug gap, depends on the compression in the cylinder. It will probably go up to about 20, 21,000 volts. <coughs> Well, isn't the repetitive inspection that's required at 
they do that's required uh, if they force the other to take their assets away from the commission uh, switch. The commission? Yes. There is an AED on the ignition switch from Bendix, which is 76712, which basically says, in a nutshell, that every 100 hours, you're going to turn the switch all the way to off and make sure the engine stops. They had lots of problems where you turn it off and it didn't do anything, so the engine was still alive. And more to the point, if you had a problem and wanted to turn it off, it wouldn't work. And that's a 100-hour repeat on all switches prior to about 1977. They then modified the switches and on the back of the switch they put a white dot and if it's got a white dot then it doesn't apply. One more thing I should mention on this mag again, it may be something that you've all been through. Bendix has some real cute terminology for one of the big problems with this mag. Now to you and I they're cracks. <coughs> this one has got a typical crack, I don't know if you can see it, it runs right down there. That mag goes through to the inside of the body. Bendix don't call them cracks. They've got a big picture and it says stress relief fissure. But it's a crack. <laughs> <laughs> You'll probably end up having more mags changed, quote, for stress relief fissures than you will for any other problem. This one you can see it's actually heading towards the mounting. There is a Bendix service bulletin that shows you hundreds of pictures of stress relief fissures and says good, no good. They say that if two or more cracks meet at the same point, scrap it. They say that if the area in here, quote, is suffering from, quote, stress relief fissures, change it. But as I say, they're cracks. The mechanic may come to you and say, I've got to change your mag because your mag is cracked. Some cracked mags are acceptable, and because it's cracked, it doesn't mean to say it's got to be changed. The answer to it is to check the Bendix bulletin and to go by their limits. I think their limits are if it's longer than three inches, I think it is, or if there's more than two join at the same place, or if the crack goes all the way through, then you have to change it. If you've got the average mag, and every, I guarantee every one of these mags you look at, except a brand new one, is going to be cracked, without exception. If the mechanic looks at it and says to you, your mag is cracked, I want it changed, or you need to change it, ask him, did you check the bulletin? because per the bulletin it may be fine. You can have one of these mags where in the first 50 hours it gets to the stage of this one, you can have one of these mags that goes a thousand hours and the crack never changes. So just because the mag is cracked it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be changed. Does the crack in a mag uh, affect the pressurization of the mag? No, because only your airplane is pressurized. The, you've got the, the two or the 3000 series mag. Your engine is a J2BD. Um, Steve's airplane is the Superstar 2, which has got a Chieftain engine in it, which is the TIO 540 J2BD, and that engine, which is a dual, a single drive dual mag, is a pressurized mag. The Aerostar mags are not pressurized. Um, so the concern with the crack is just the structural integrity, the thing they break yeah. apart. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, if the crack becomes too big, it can let pole shoes move, <coughs> and there's all sorts of little problems that can occur through it. Any other questions on the ignition system? Okay, well, we've been going for about two and a half hours now. We're going to let Alan take a break for a few minutes. Alan, you get an eight-point <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a great job. I can't believe it was too late. <laughs> <laughs> this last couple of weeks, we seem to have inherited a thousand million questions on pressurization. Everyone we've spoken to has ended up asking questions on pressurization. So what we thought we'd do was to take the pressurization system and to try and go through it. The pressurization system is basically three components. There's the controller and two valves. There's the outflow valve, which is this one. For all intents and purposes, this is the one that's normally working. <coughs> and there's the safety valve, which is this one. They're exactly the same, except this one's got a solenoid on the back of it. Other than that, they're no different. And there's the controller. 
standard Aerostar controller is very similar to this except it has an additional knob in the center. <coughs> when they designed this unit, they had the thing controlled by an electric motor. And this is the motor, and basically, when you vary the rear stat on the front, you are just varying the voltage to the motor, making the motor go faster or slower. And they were clever and they called this the rate control. Someone suddenly realized, but what happens if we're up at altitude and we lose the electrics? How are we going to be able to turn it? So you'll note that on your controllers, you've got a center knob, and when you turn that center knob, it rotates the whole works around. That is purely a safety feature in case you're up there and you lose your electric. It's not the system that you normally can use. <coughs> you would normally adjust your altitude or set your altitude with the outside control. And what they've done inside here is they have a Android capsule. And the Android capsule seats against the pilot valve. And when you are off the ground, the spot switch is made, your solenoid allows the safety valve to seat so now that you're all set to pressurize the controller is sending cabin pressure down one single pipe to the outflow valve where it would enter on this in this side <coughs> so now on the outflow valve side this of course is bolted uh, above the, <coughs> the first bulkhead back above the rear cabin shelf, the hatch shelf. <coughs> the safety valve, uh, the outflow valve is now set to close. But what they've done is they've stuck a diaphragm in, in the outflow valve. The center area senses ambient pressure, telcom pressure inside. <coughs> the side of the diaphragm senses cabin pressure. Through the small hole on the back is the pressure from the controller, which is also cabin pressure. So what they do is when the system is calling for more pressure, the controller basically opens the pull and lets cabin pressure come down the line to the back side of the diaphragm. The diaphragm moves and closes. <coughs> when you are saying to the system, I want less cabin pressure, it bleeds off some of that pressure on the back side from this side of the diaphragm. The diaphragm retracts and cabin air dumps through here, out of here, into the rear cabin. On most of the aerostars, and certainly the older ones, where they have this little valve on the side, <coughs> there's been a lot of comments quote about just tweaking the valve, and I don't think anyone really understands exactly what it does. What they've done is they've run a balance pipe from the same area behind the diaphragm where the controller pushes out they've added a little balance pipe and they just vented that outside behind the rear cabin <coughs> and what they try to do is to gently balance what goes in as against what's coming out in the behind the diaphragm area so what they are doing on the new controllers is they're making this a fixed orifice Whereas I think if you read in the manual, the manual even tells you how to set the valve up. But when you speak to Dukes, they say, don't touch it. Because what happens is this governs the rate of, of which the controller air bleeds out of the back of the valve. So what happens is if you've got this valve closed, as soon as you break ground, your outflow valve's going to snap shut. And it's not going to do your ears any good. If you've got the valve too far open, then what happens is the valve will just never close. Because it's dumping more pickles, what is going into the controller is being dumped straight out again. I think the book tells you to start off with something like one turn open. And then what they have you do is they have you fly the airplane up to altitude. And you adjust this valve <coughs> so that the cabin doesn't fly and it doesn't descend when you're at that altitude. Irrespective of whether it's the same altitude as you've selected. They just want to make sure it doesn't change. So if you're at 5,000 feet, they don't want it to go up, they don't want it to go down. <coughs> that is when they have you adjust the smell, so that the gentle air that's coming in, it gets gently let out again. The rear part of this outflow valve is purely for when you come to max dip. What this portion of the valve does is this has the pipe that comes from the left side of the nose, just forward of the cabin door, the little static port. Static air is on 
comes into the back end in here and inside here is a diaphragm and a spring and what they do is they take static air onto the back side of the diaphragm and the cabin pressure air which is around the unit onto the other side of the diaphragm and it just senses the difference between the two and when you get to max stiff it just pops open the little diaphragm when the diaphragm pops open it opens a little valve and the valve dumps off the air that is behind the back diaphragm system is calling for more pressure. Pressurized cabin air from the controller comes down the con from the controller into the back side of the diaphragm. <coughs> when it does so, it moves this part of the diaphragm down, which closes off, we'll call it this area here. This would be cabin pressure trying to come out through there. Pushes the diaphragm down. <coughs> seats all the way around the outside and they are cabin air can't escape through there out into the tower when you get out to the cabin that's cabin dead static air from outside the nose on the left hand side comes to the back side of this diaphragm pressurized air from the cabin comes to this side of the diaphragm this pressure overcomes the pressure from the spring and the static air and lifts this up and when it lifts this up this little poppet valve unseats and the cabin air pressure that is in the back side of the diaphragm then just bleeds straight up outside the safety valve is basically exactly the same thing <coughs> except what they do is they take the static port to a different place they take this static port instead of taking it outside the aeroplane they take the static port to in the, in the rear fuselage <coughs> so this static port comes out just beside the outflow valve outside of the pressurised bulkhead the point being if they both came from one static source and the static source throws over you've got a problem also on here they stick a solenoid valve solenoid valve is controlled by the squat switch and basically what happens is that when you are sitting on the ground the squat switch operates the solenoid so that there is no cabin pressure going to the back side of this diaphragm in other words it doesn't allow the pressure in here so this diaphragm never moves downwards so the, so the diaphragm never seals around the outside the valve never closes and the cabin can't pressurize on a lot of other models of aeroplane what they do is as well as the solenoid, they have a valve on the back so that the vacuum is applied to the solid, to the safety valve, and it's actually held open by a vacuum. They don't do that in Aerostar. In Aerostar, they just stop it from, from pressurizing in the first place. That would, that would also be controlled <coughs> by your normal dump switch if you wanted to manually dump. If you select manually dump, it opens the port in here which bleeds off the pressure that's on the back side of the diaphragm so the diaphragm then just opens yeah and then the cabin so just the spot switch or the main yes um, a couple of interesting things about this is that if you look at how the pocket valve portion works which only works when you're at max depth 
with the two lines, one from the control rod and one that comes outside the nose to the, to the static source. If you get water in this portion of the system, you've now totally disabled your max diff portion of the system. Let's say you're on the ground and the airplane's outside and you've got water in your outside static port. Now it sits out there overnight and it's freezing cold and the water freezes. You've blocked off this with ground pressure in it, outside air pressure in it. Now you go and fly the airplane, the cabin pressure is never going to be higher than this pressure. Of course, this was ground pressure that's trapped in there now through the ice. So this max diff valve is never going to open. So whereas this one is set to 4.3, Okay, and the safety valve is set 0.2 or down higher. So this one will never open. The safety <coughs> valve, which is set to do exactly the same thing as this, but 0.2 pounds higher, that will then open. So consequently, your max stiff valve is never going to be working. So when you're down below max, uh, so if you get ice and if you get water in the system that freezes up and blocks off this static pipe, your max stiff portion of this valve is just disabled. It blocks your safety. Yeah. How would you know it? You wouldn't know it. <coughs> if your gauge you was accurate enough to show it, then you would now show that your max diff is now probably up to the red line. Oh, Whereas before, it's going to be fractionally below it. But 0.2 pounds, I don't even know if you could read that on the gauge. Alan knows, uh, years ago, when we first uh, designed the pressurized airplanes, it was my recollection that um, we had such an icing incident during uh, developmental flight tests. And um, that was at a time where the uh, inside portion of the fitting where that nose mounted status <coughs> vent is actually oriented downwards. In other words, the vent is on a vertical surface and then the line would come straight down before it went back up and it was trapping moisture where it went down. My recollection, we reoriented that so the fan goes up first so that you can never have a situation where there's moisture trapped in that system. So if you have, unless you have a, an obviously iced over static um, vent on uh, the outside of the aircraft, it is highly unlikely that you will get into this particular icing situation. Those are not heated vents, by the way. Is there a drain in the line there? Yeah. Um, so well, the newer there. models has a drain in the left hand wheel bank. Yeah. <coughs> but it's certainly not on all of them. The right, the right hand little static port is for the pedostatic system for your engine instruments? Oh, no, this side was not yet. That's the internal static for your engine. Alternate static, okay. Yeah. The other interesting thing about this is if you've now got water in the system and it doesn't freeze till you get to altitude, now you've got the reverse. The cabin pressure is going to overcome this pressure when you're on your way down, opening this as if you're at max depth, which is going to open this and bleed off the cabin pressure. And it's going to stay like that all the way down. So at that point, the cabin altitude is going to change with the aircraft altitude. So it's interesting that what, what this can do, whether it freezes on the ground or whether it freezes in the air. And if you've just got water float about, floating about, there's likely to do anything. I was speaking to Steve Thompson down at Piper's last week and when we were discussing this and I was saying to him that if it freezes up it's going to be this thing if it freezes when you're down it's going to be this thing and he was telling me that he was involved in case just last year they did exactly <coughs> the same problem um, if you get the problem and your aeroplane is not one that has the drains in the wheel bay then the only thing you can do is go back to the controller disconnect the static line and blow out the static line this static line here doesn't go anywhere except to the port on the left side of the nose. Can you explain how the aneroid works just briefly? How, how the controller is sent and then decides when to get more information open or closed it? On the controller? Yeah. Okay. I have to tell you all that at midnight last night, if Ken could have got this answer out, I mean, he kept me up all night, he would have done, but I said, enough, let's go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> this is basically the outside of the controller, with a pipe coming off, which goes down to the outflow valve. Like here you've got your rate control. 
Well, here you've got your actual altitude control. On the back of the weight control, a little rear stuff, that's the potentiometer. And all that does is varies the voltage that can be applied to the order. It varies the speed of the motor by changing the voltage of the motor. The motor drives a gear, that gear drives a shaft. This is connected, this sensor shaft is connected via a series of gears to the gear on the motor. So when you vary the rate control, it changes the speed at which the motor drives this whole shaft. And this shaft is attached in the centre of the housing, it's actually screwed in. So when you turn this whole knob, I'll pass this round for you to see, but when you turn this whole knob, you can just see the knob, the shaft actually moves in and moves out. And what it's doing is in the back of the control, there is a, uh, an aneroid capsule. And attached to the back of the aneroid capsule is a little pilot valve. It'll be off the platform in a minute. Can you tell us what an aneroid capsule is? An aneroid capsule is a... Uh, a metallic canister virtually like a concertina you know one of those musical type things and what happens is it's got so I don't know what the gas is that's in it but it's sealed with this gas in it and it's very prone to temperature and or pressure change, pressure changes depending on what it's going to be used in. And what will happen is the higher the pressure the more this thing condenses and the lower the pressure the more it expands. It's just a sealed unit. What happens is you turn, you turn your rate control, you tell the system to pressurize, the motor spins accordingly, rotating this round to bring this back to the point that you've rotated it to. So you turn it round to 5,000 feet. The controller turns the to, to guide the motor at what speed to drive. The motor rotates and starts to wind this to your 5,000 feet mark, comes back around to the top. In doing so, it changes the pressure on the aneroid capsule. The aneroid capsule then, in turn, opens, a little pilot, uh, opens another little pilot valve. And as it opens or closes, it either lets air out of this pipe to the aneroid, to the outflow valve, or it doesn't let air out to the outflow valve. When the cabin pressure is too low, it's actually, I've actually got this the wrong way around because when this contracts, when the cabin pressure is too low, the aneroid capsule contracts, and when it contracts, that's when it lets the air out of the pipe. I've got this valve drawn backwards. When the cabin pressure is too high, it squashes. When the cabin pressure is too low, this thing expands and lets air out of this. As I say, I've got this the wrong way around. So when the cabin pressure is too low, this thing expands, opens the pocket valve, and air comes out of here to the controller, makes the outflow valve close, cabin pressure builds up. When the cabin pressure is now at the desired setting, the aneroid capsule expands, pushes the pilot valve against the seat, and now doesn't push any more air down the line. <coughs> so the outflow valve doesn't change. The interesting points about this thing are, I don't know if, if any of you have ever listened to your controller, but when you turn your selector unit, when you turn it away from the two white triangles lining up, you can hear the micro switches click. Do you notice that? If it's mm -hmm. or interest. No, no you right in your nose, time. you can hear the micro switches click. Oh, the micro switches, sure. Yeah. And if you want to actually see it move. No, but I'm, yeah, I'm not, I wasn't talking about that. <coughs> but you can hear the micro switches click. If you want to try the unit and, and check that the electrical portion of it is working, if you just turn your, micro switch, uh, your master switch on and wind the rate control up to full increase, when you move this past the switches, as you turn, there is a central position where you can hear it is in between the clicks. I don't know if you can all hear that. 
Like that's off to one side. That's in between. That's the other way. You hear it? Mm -hmm. If you set the controller in between the two clips, nothing should happen. You won't hear the motor running or anything else. If you wind the controller up, the second you pass that first clip, you should immediately hear the motor running. When you hear the motor running, if you vary this up or down, you should hear the motor change speed. When you bring it back to, in between the clicks again, it should stop, and when you wind it back the other way again, you should hear the same thing in reverse. You'll be surprised at the number of controllers that we've, quote, gone out to play with, and we've found that you move the switch from that centre of detent over past one way or the other, and the motor don't do anything and you wind it another quarter of an inch and then real slowly the motor starts to work because there's a problem with the micro switches inside it. The other thing about that, Alan, this is what Pop Scott of Piper says, um, is whenever you're going to adjust your, your outer dial, changing anything, always turn your rate control down to the lowest point because that motor may be heading in one direction. You suddenly switch the other way, the gears strip. So if you, if you have it shut down to the least, least amount of action in there, then you're not suddenly going first gear into reverse, doing 10 miles an hour, so to speak, and the less chance of doing damage that way. The other interesting thing about this is that when you turn this, a little cam works, two little miniature mi micro switches. 90% of the time with these, when you move it past the click and the motor doesn't do anything until you turn it more, you can the micro switch. 